good chum, I'm a good dog. How the hell am I looking here? Am I centered? Am I good? Looks like I got my paperwork document. How do I look? Good, cool, right, great, nice. Hey everybody, it's Chunk the Good Dog. How are you guys doing out there? I think I'm flying solo this uh, this little Q and A. Um, uh, Miss Morgan is missing in action. Uh, I think she just got super caught up this week, so you just get me. So hopefully I can make up. I can pull up the slack, but it it'll be tough. But let's see what I can do. Let's see if I can pull something off for you guys. So let's jump into a little bit of the show and just see what we get right um hope you guys are all good were we here last week i think we might have missed last week um yeah there's been all yeah it's just been it's been super crazy busy um and if we were here last week then um awesome then no apologies if we missed last week then apologies I'm, i honestly can't remember if we did a show last week let's see let me let me let me let me just go Uh, you know, I just can't say. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, let's wrap about some stuff. Okay, so we've got this UK seminar, me and Jeffrey Gelman. Only I can call him Jeffrey and probably Linda. Um, so there's been lots of hubbub, lots of chaos, lots of some pretty nasty stuff. Um, there's been... There's been threats of violence. Um, there's been all sorts of like nasty, really kind of vile talk about like putting us in like a storage container and putting tools on us and dragging us around and shocking the bejesus out of us. Um, there's been anti-Semitic um, stuff about Jeff, um, which is super unfortunate. Um, we've even contemplated like getting people involved <clears throat> in like anti-defamation league i mean it's just been it's been unbelievable that we're talking about a dog training situation and i was actually talking to a friend of mine from the music world from way back in the day <clears throat> and um you know we had we've had this location that we've so let, let me backtrack a little bit so we've had two locations if i'm not mistaken and then we've had massive massive protests pushback phone calls emails from the pure positive camp in the UK and they've managed to create enough pressure to cause those folks to say sorry we, we can't do it it's too much heat we can't take the heat right so so I reached out to a friend of mine um, he's known as the Swedish gangster um, and this is like two worlds that we'll probably never, never cross. Uh, he'll probably never even hear about this. But we used to tour together and he used to uh, book a lot of shows um, for the bands when we'd be in the UK and Europe and stuff like that. And he's from Sweden. And uh, so I just said, hey, man, what, you know, what, what do you got? You, you know, any chances you might have something outside of London that you could book us into? Because they're giving us a hard time and there's threats of protests and the police are getting involved. And it's this whole, it's like it's unbelievable, right? And, um, and he's like, what do you mean? You know, wh what are you talking about? Is there, is there weird stuff in the dog training world? And I had to kind of like backtrack and try and explain to him what this is, you know, it's really, really, really hard to explain to somebody who has no experience in the dog training world to try and wrap their head around why there might be something so toxic where people would be making physical threats, death threats, anti-Semitic remarks, you know, stuff like that. So we went through it and he was like, wow, that's amazing. Anyways, I just, I just share that just because all, all of us in the dog training world, we're like, yeah, of course, we've heard it a million times, but it's a good check-in. It's a good reality check for, for folks that aren't involved in it, or uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a good check check in for folks that are in it to hear from people that aren't in it because then you really get this perspective of like 
of what's going on what why 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 are things in such a like almost like religious fervor uh so anyways that was that was kind of an interesting uh conversation trying to clue him in and i was like yeah you your your buddy who you know your drummer friend here um is kind of one of the faces of this kind of balanced trainers movement and uh so catch a lot of heat and he was like wow that's crazy and anyways so i i digress a lot but i just wanted to share that just because i thought it was i thought it was funny just trying to explain to somebody on the outside how dog trainers would be getting death threats and things like that it's pretty unbelievable um so they shut down they managed to like emails phone calls um, threats of protests, all sorts of pressure at this spot that we were going to do at a, at a football field, also known as soccer for you folks in, in, in the States. And um, they put enough pressure on them to where they were like, man, we don't want to take the heat. So they backed out, which I get. And uh, so then they were in a victory dance that, you know, we, you know, there's, there's a thing circulating, like not in our country, not in our county. And like this big dramatic thing of like none of these torture devices, you know, we're talking about prong collars and e-collars and none of these, like the language is just like, it's ridiculous about the, 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 the emotional strings they're trying to pull by painting pictures of these tools being torture devices. It's just, it's fascinating stuff. So anyways, is what it is. Good news is the good guys have prevailed. Um, we've locked down a spot and we've got probably an even better spot than we had prior. So the location will go undisclosed. So all you nasties, if you happen to be tuning into this, you shan't find it. Um, and if you do, it doesn't matter but uh, we won't be announcing it except for the people that are actually in attendance. So we try and keep the hassle and the, and the aggravation down, but we'll probably have security there and all that stuff. Like, yeah, for a dog training seminar, we're gonna have security. I'm, I'm already talking to like some friends about they're talking about flying out and you know, people that have done executive protection and things like that. So yeah, I'm speechless. It's just, it's a crazy thing. Um, so let's move on from the crazy. Good news is me and Jeff are leaving on like, uh, I think we're leaving Wednesday for, uh, for the UK. And then I think if I'm not mistaken, we start in Glasgow and do a uh, two day seminar, then pack walk, barbecue, Q and A, whole bunch of fun stuff. There's still a couple tickets left if I'm not mistaken, I think for, for uh, Glasgow. Um, and just, it's gonna be a blast and it's gonna be a really fantastic opportunity to connect with a lot of these UK fans that are looking for answers and looking for different solutions and alternatives and, and have been pressured and scared and freaked out and kind of had to like fly under the radar trying to find their way. So it'll be, it'll be, uh, it'll be a really, it'll be a special treat to be able to meet them, hang out and try and encourage them and support them. Uh, trainers as well. They're so, there's so many trainers over there that are afraid to come out and come out of the closet, so to speak, and share what they're doing. Some are definitely coming out and like doing their thing. They're catching heat. Some are hiding, you know, or like, not, I won't say hiding out, but like laying low. And um, so I'm hoping that this is more of a mission that gives people a little bit of oomph, a little bit of, yeah, let's take some heat. This is worth it. This is mission. This is about, helping dogs and owners actually succeed. This is about offering people solutions that actually really work for situations where they've tried other things and nothing's worked and they're on, you know, on, on the precipice of like getting rid of their dog, rehoming their dog, you know, putting their dog down, something like that. Um, so this is, this, is, this is bigger than just a seminar. This is about mission and this is about empowering the owners and it's also about empowering and supporting trainers that are trying to get their footing over there to feel a little more confident. We're happy to take the heat so they can feel a little more uh, confident about taking their own heat. So anyways, so that's, that's what's cooking in the UK. Uh, should be an interesting trip. We're gonna, me and Jeff are gonna social media the hell out of it. So you'll see if there's any monkey business. Um, I can't imagine Jeff being injured any more than he was falling off that, that girl's, that little girl's pink bicycle, if you haven't seen it. 
um, go to Solid Canine Training and scroll down until you find the video of Jeff trying to train a uh, German Shepherd to heel next to him or jog next to him on a little girl's bike because the adult bike was broken. It's a little girl's bike. It's pink. It's tiny. It's got tassels on the handlebar, on the handle grips, and he goes over the bars face first. I don't even think he gets a hand down. Just a uh, complete eye support. And uh, so I can't imagine him taking any worse, any worse uh, abuse than what he's dished out to himself. But uh, we'll see. So and moving on from that, we got Corley here, a uh, new intern, just came in uh, a couple days ago. Uh, she's originally from Switzerland, but she moved to Toronto. She's been in Toronto for several years. She's a trainer out there. And uh, she's a T3 grad. She's really awesome. Um, even more awesome because she brought Swiss chocolate because she was just seeing her folks out in Switzerland. Thanks, Coralie. And um, she's just an awesome, awesome lady. And we like her a lot. And uh, so she's just beginning her journey here with us about learning all of our program and our systems and our safety protocols and and our our blueprint and our psychology of like what we're looking for. And that a lot of things that people think are just kind of like cookie cutter you know, I had, I've had I've got some new trainers in here that are working with us and, and going back and forth room to room with different dogs. They've been watching and just going, wow, like, yeah, there's this blueprint and this blueprint we're really pulling from. All the dogs have to do all these behaviors, but how we're moving them through the blueprint, how we're moving them through all the, all the behaviors is like miles apart, vastly different, complete different situation. And, um, and that's the art form. That's about the read on the dog and what does the dog need to succeed it does the dog have a attitude issue a personality issue does the dog have a defiant kind of bull you know bully bratty thing does the dog have cognitive issues is the dog slower than other dogs is the dog so overwhelmed and anxious and freaked out that it needs more hand holding so knowing being able to read the dogs like if there is any real to me art form in this it's that it's looking at a dog and being able to see into the dog and go this dog needs this, this, and this to be able to get from here to here. And so that's kind of the cool, fun part for me uh, of having interns here as well as new trainers, being able to share that information and pass that on and, and watching kind of their eyes light up when they're like, ah, oh, and they make the connections and, and they can actually, phys they, they can physically see it. They're right there and they're like, ah, oh, I can, I can see what you're talking about with that dog being, you know, struggling with this moment and I can show them how to, work through the process and how to make one choice with your body with your body as far as like body language or motion or tone or whatever you do that actually creates the opportunity to look in deeper into the dog as far as decision making skills and, and what they're capable of and things like that. Anyways, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of fun when people are really interested and really want to learn and you can dive into the really, really, you can do the macro, macro, like here's the giant blueprint of what we're looking at and here's the micro and here's how we fine tune every little thing. So it's been a lot of fun and that's kind of it. So with that, I'm going to jump into the show. Like I said, I'm solo. So just get me. Um, I'm hoping this isn't clickety clacking on my uh, floor de lis. So, fingers crossed. Anyways, what do we got here? All right. Hey, everybody, it's Sean for The Good Dog. And this is The Good Dog's Q&A Saturday episode. I'm sure I'm doing it wrong. Episode 139. And all this stuff, I'm doing it backwards. All this stuff that you can't see, and there's nothing you can't see. There's no Manny, there's no Bella, and there's no one here. It's just me. Makes up the Good Dogs Q&A Saturday. Episode number 139. So one of these days, maybe on the 200th episode, I'll, I'll get that flow and I'll figure it out. But uh, you guys can bear with me, right? Take, take, take the good with the bad, the, the lumps with the, uh, the smooth. Uh, all right, let's jump into the show and see what the uh, first question is, all right? Okay, guys, can you tell? You probably can't tell. No shoesies. It's, a, it's cozy time with you guys. Okay, so let's jump into the first question here. This question, um, and this light is like blinding me, so if I'm squinting, no old guy jokes, all right? Take it easy on me. Okay, so... <clears throat> Megan says, 
What do you do when your dog freezes and gets lazier during uh, e-collar conditioning? How do you know it's the right level even when they're ignoring it if it's lower but freezing and getting stiff when it's higher? And then she goes on because Megan really wanted to ask a few other questions. Hold on. And she says, another question. E-collar levels and reactivity, do you use a boost and all? And do you correct for be, uh, do you correct for reactions at higher levels? How do you train for an auto eye contact with your dog? Well, she's asking, Megan, you really like, you really like uh, getting your money's worth here, lady. Um, and do you use it with uh, people reactive dogs too? Also, I do transition. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so I can't answer all those questions. So we'll just we'll tackle a couple at a time, and um, Megan will just have to show up again. All right. So, so she's got a dog freezing on the e collar. So it gets lazier, right? So okay. So dog freezes on the e collar. Um, gets lazier, gets uninspired, sounds like he's unmotivated, uh, doesn't sound like he's like really having a great time, right? So, um, and then we'll get to the other questions, or at least a couple of them. So, it's not unusual for dogs if you're doing a ton of reps and you're doing pressure on the e-collar, even at low levels, and you're doing it over and over and over again. It's like doing any kind of like mundane task and like, and there's, pressure at the same time right so you're doing this thing over and over and over and over and over again and and if there's like e-collar pressure even at low levels it's just annoying and, and it gets the dog to where they're just kind of like bummed out right it's not fun and so for us our whole thing if you watch our dvd our, our e-collar dvd the whole game plan is like trying to move off of the pressure sooner rather than later and the more the more I do this work, the quicker I try and move that arc of getting off the pressure. And I, I like to think of it as, you know, escape training where you're on the button longer as you initially teach the, teach the behavior, but then you start fading it quicker and quicker as the dog's complying quicker and quicker. And I like to think of it as a reward for the dog doing good behavior. Finally, you're at prompts, which is just a quick tap, right? So I always talk about it being a four thing process, full escape training, like sit butt hits the ground button off sit butts headed towards butts headed towards the ground hard to do at the same time fingers off butt hits the ground right so you're already off the button earlier sit butt hits the ground that's prompts you're on the third one fourth sit if he doesn't do it sit tap the button so four different things four different kind of uh layers or sections of of how we kind of move through the e-collar process but we try and get there, and in our DVDs and stuff, we've 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 given we've laid out kind of a, a process that's slower to make sure that nobody rushes too fast with the dog, and so we'd almost rather have a slower dog, right? Even though this sounds like I'm contradicting, but a slower dog rather than somebody moving too fast. In the grand scheme of things, I'd rather your dog be like slow and be like, okay, because eventually he'll come around when you guys like go out and do fun stuff. But if somebody moves too fast and it's confusing the dog and overwhelming the dog, that's a, a much more precarious situation. So what I would recommend is I would recommend uh, a couple things, uh, getting off the, off the uh, get, getting off the pressure sooner or just going straight to corrections if your dog's been patterned and your dog gets it what I would do is I would just do that four-step process I just did and see where your dog's at right so start getting off the button earlier start then start going to prompts then give your dog a chance and see what he does and correct for not for non-compliance if you feel your dog knows the behavior completely comprehensively without a doubt right that said, also have a long line or a leash on your dog so you can guide your dog through any of these behaviors. So if your dog's unsure, if your dog's uh, you know not clear about it, the e-collar doesn't give any directional information. Always remember that the e-collar just is a sensation. The leash is what gives directionality to the e-collar pressure. Without it, it's, I mean, your voice says too in your body language or your body position, gives information to that, but the leash or the long line is the most important piece of that. So if your dog is slowing down, you're probably on the pressure too long, uh, you're probably doing way too many reps, 
um, or just too many reps. I'm not trying to hard time you. Um, you could bring food out. You could get some some treats involved. So you try and like offset it. But if 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 I can give you any advice, try and get off the pressure sooner. Try and get to correction sooner, so the dog wins the game. And then and and you can simultaneously start adding some food or some treats or some rewards in there, and some some maybe like some more peppy kind of stuff as far as like body language and like come on, good boy, good boy, you know, add some stuff, get a little more momentum, things like that. If you're like Francis, come, they're gonna be like. Hmm. This really sucks. All right, so that's that's how you try and get more motivation. And your question was like, well, he doesn't really care at lower levels, but at higher levels, he's freezing. I don't know what e-collar you're using. That's another kind of like variable in this. So if you're using an e-collar that doesn't have tiny little incremental variations in the levels, that could be a problem. If you're going from like, if you've got like one through 15 and you're going from five to six and from five to six is like 10 or 15 levels, on like a mini educator that's problematic so that's another variable that i can't really speak to because i don't know uh okay so uh do we use boost we do not use boost i never use boost with any of our clients or any of our trainers a lot of people love it a lot of people dig it we don't we always what we call dial organically i want people to get good at dialing towards whatever level they need to be up down in between with their dog the boost is very easy to be at the wrong level on. The, the, the concept of like, if you set your boost for 10 or 20 and that you're going to like, that, that 10 or 20 is always gonna be a good fit, to me, just doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to dial because I know that I can dial exactly where I want it to get uh, for the dog in that moment, in that exact context. And I think that owners are completely capable of doing the same thing. They just need practice. The whole boost thing, it's, it's, if you got like a, a perfect turnkey dog or a, a hard as nails dog and they're like, they don't care if levels are a little bit like goofy and a little bit like harsh or, you know, most pet dogs, you gotta be a little more careful, gotta be a little more cautious. So anyways, um, as far as the um, eye contact, boy, did you ask a lot of questions, Megan? Um, I appreciate it, but. So eye contact, we just say no for any untoward staring, whether it's dogs, kids, skateboards, cats, squirrels, whatever. No, tap of the button. We look for the level the dog cares about. How do they know they care about it? They turn away from whatever they're looking at, right? Is it avoidance? Yes, it's mild avoidance. But what dogs end up doing is they learn that the safest place to look is at you, right? It, it happens with almost every single dog and in a very, very quick timeline. So dogs are out walking and they're staring at something. No, I'm like, oof, no, come up a little bit. No, <laughs> you find the right level and the dog's like, I'll look at you because this is the best place to look. I'm like, cool, awesome. And that happens over the course of a couple days or a handful of days. If you're using levels that the dog cares about, you'll start to see the dog looking to you as the safe spot because looking at dogs gets them corrected. And looking at dogs also is, and if anybody was like, correcting dogs for looking at dogs, you're gonna make them hate dogs. No, they're already loading when they're looking at dogs. What you're doing is blocking the visual loading process. Dogs need to look at other dogs in order to load, in order to have reactivity. If they can't, if you poked all their eyes out, and I'm not saying that, but if you poked all their eyes out, you'd have a lot less reactivity, right? That's why they've got that Facebook awesome product, the hood that they put over the dog's head. Um, you know, if you can try. That's all right. It's an inside joke, kind of. I mean, you guys have all probably seen it on Facebook. We also did it with Henri the other day where we, um, we didn't ever post it just because we thought it was in poor taste, but we took her sweatshirt and like put it over her head. And it was like, cool for like owners and dogs that are reactive. Like, let's cover both their faces so, so nobody really freaks out. Anyways, Megan, I hope that answered some of your questions. The rest you'll have to hit us up with next week. All right. Man, I feel the pressure of the solo run here. Um, okay, so this is um, uh, question number two is from Dawn. Dawn asks, <clears throat> wanting to start my uh, own training business, but don't know where to start. I attended National Canine School for Dog Trainers and I'm a CDT, Certified Dog Trainer. But now what? I'm not sure what my next step is 
uh, what do I do first? Pick a business name, get a business, get business insurance, business cards, business licenses. I would love to attend California T3. I currently work full time. I also volunteer with the local obedience club teaching group classes. Help, don't know where to start. Excellent question, Don. And um, having taught a caboodle of T3s, um, I know where you're at and you're in good company. Um, anybody who started the started a business has been there, so so I know what it's like. And m my personal thing, let me, let me give you the blueprint of my personal thing. My personal thing is when you're starting from scratch, with zero, it sounds like you got zero. You don't even have a business name, business cards, and you got nothing. Start with everything. Do everything. Business cards, get your license, get your insurance, get the DBA. Um, what else do I got note-wise for you? Um, build your website, uh, work on your SEO, work on videos, work on your social media, work on all that stuff, right? Do everything. Do, do training in the park, put ads on your car, wear t-shirts. You're trying to get attention. You're trying to get people to, to find out who you are so they can potentially hire you. Before they can potentially hire, hire you, they've got to find out or know about you, right? So initially, you don't have any leverage. You don't have any, any uh, traction. So you have to do everything. When I first started out, I did everything. I went around with business cards. I went to vets. I went to uh, food places, not like restaurants um, for dogs. Um, I wore t-shirts. I had magnets on my car. Um, I had graphics later on my other car. Um, <clears throat> of course, I had a website, had a business name, DBA license, all blah, 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 all that stuff. But the point is that I really want you to get, start there. Start with everything. You're, you, you can't be choosy. You can't be fancy. You can't be like, well, no, you got to do everything because you've got to try and find your way into creating some kind of awareness and a name for yourself. That said, you should also have in the back of your mind that you should be shooting for something different down the line. You don't want to be scrambling for clients your entire career. You don't want to be like, yeah, I got to put more business cards up at the vet clinic and I got to like get more t-shirts so people see me at the park and I got to like, to me, that's a losing battle as far as like any kind of real juicy dependable sales and business model, I find that to be um, not the best way to go. So here's an interesting thing. I don't have business cards. I don't have any graphics on any of my cars. There's no t-shirts with a good dog. There's no demos with a fancy demo dog. There's a, a lot of the things that a lot of trainers utilize to create sales, we don't. Initially, we did everything, right? But then you start moving towards a different kind of model. And that model is making sure you've got a kick-ass website, kick-ass SEO so they can find your website, kick-ass social media so they can find your website as well, and then reinforce your experience of your website because social media and websites can really work to kind of like reinforce each other, if that makes sense, right? So somebody looks at your website and goes, oh, they look pretty cool. Then smart people are gonna go to your Instagram, are gonna go to your Facebook, and they're gonna look there, and they're gonna go, oh, okay. Oh, she's being kind of like oh, a jackass there. I don't really like her. Or, wow, here's some great videos of her doing some great work, and now I feel even better about her. So your social media will oftentimes reinforce your website. Your website will reinforce your social media, and they'll be like two indestructible forces creating before and after videos, videos where people get to see results, creating value. Like my whole concept when I started this was very simple. I've said this at T3 a million times. And when I sat down at Facebook, not the like headquarters, like Facebook in front of my desktop computer, <laughs> just to be clear, when I sat down in front of my computer working on Facebook, I had, I had one question, I was like, what would cause me to come back to somebody's page every day? 
simple question. What would cause me personally to come back to someone's page every day? And whose pages was I coming back to every day? And it was simple. It was just people creating and sharing tons of quality value every single day. And I just saw on a marketing Facebook page, somebody was asking, how do you create more Facebook? How do you get more Facebook likes? How do you get more Facebook audience? How do you get more traction? I'm coming up on 30,000 likes organically. I've never put out a post saying, like my page. I've never put out a post saying, um, follow my page or follow us or anything like that. Have I put money into promoting and making sure that our 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 organic reach is spread absolutely but i've never ever 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 asked anyone to like my page all i've done is put up content daily hard ass work that i think is valuable and then i've let people come to me so value sharing caring giving being generous not holding stuff tight to your vest you want to like separate yourself from the pack be really nice really nice be really supportive and be extremely generous and have boundaries too right you got to have those in in alignment too but if you put those that especially you put kindness and generosity together it'll really separate you from the pack with dog trainers and if you start doing that in, in formats or in platforms or on platforms where people really are, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, you can, you can have an audience in no time if you're doing good work and if you're sharing high quality, high value stuff. So to reiterate, you're at the very beginning, you're at the starting line. Start with everything. There's no time to be fancy or choosy right now. You do every single thing you can. Dog walking. I mean, I started as a dog walker. You, whatever you've got to do to get your foot in the door and get people to start to recognize and realize who you are. Like I said, I, I won't go through the whole list again because I'm famous for that. But you heard it the first time. Then, from there, have your eye on the prize of like, I'm going to start creating a brand that has a perception, has a vision for one from you, but also has a perception from the outside of being a generous, kind, awesome brand that people wanna be a part of, that people wanna interact with, that people wanna spend time with. And that's up to you. That's about, that's why I'm so big on personal development. You know, that's where generosity and gratitude and giving and taking chances and taking risks and putting yourself out there, all that stuff comes from personal development. So. Hopefully that answers your question. It's a long answer, but it's a big thing. You're like, how do I start my business? You do it all. And then you start looking to, how do I make it better for myself and better for my clients as you get, as you get more traction, as you have more leverage, as you make more money, as you have more time because you're making more money and you start to like navigate that. So hopefully that helps. Um, I'm wishing you the best of luck and maybe you'll make it to T3 California because uh, it'll be a blast if you do. All right. Okay, peeps. So we got question number three. This is from, I don't know how to pronounce it. Is it Graciela? 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 It's close. It's one of those. Okay. So I'm going to read your question. Graciela has, uh, let's see. We are working with our three-year-old Doey to stop barking at people when passing our house or when our neighbor's dogs bark. We use the collar, um, I guess she's meaning e-collar, uh, and make progress during the day. The bigger problem is at night when the yep, e-collar is off and my Doby is crated. We give him the same command to stop barking, but he doesn't listen at all. Once he hears the sound of neighbors talking, dogs barking, he gets into, bark, into a barking set of mind and doesn't stop. It uh, doesn't stop for a while, even if the trigger is gone. Sometimes he escalates and starts banging on the crate to let him out, but we still let him stay in there. Sometimes he barks only, and when we check on him to see if he's standing and asking him to get out, he's actually lying down in sleeping position, blah, 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 blah. Um, how do we get better sleep at night and not have the neighbors complain? Awesome question, easy answer. I like this one. Graciela, 
You're my favorite lady this time. Okay, so Dobie is barking in the crate at night when the e-collar comes off, when people go by the house, or when the neighbor dog barks. Typical territorial stuff, but it doesn't matter. You don't want it because you can't sleep. It makes your life miserable. It makes everybody's life miserable. So here's your two, here's your two choices. Remote collar on at night and by your bedside, which is how we rock and roll here. I mean, back in the day when I was on Bellflower or in at the Bellflower house and we had the kennel right outside, I'd sleep with four remotes across my, uh, my nightstand and I could tell from every bark, I'd be like, oh, it's you. And I would correct, right? So we don't leave, the goal isn't to leave e-collars on dogs all the time, 24 seven, because as we know, if you leave them on too long and create pressure sores and things like that, they can create discomfort and it can get like messy under here. So it's not our optimum situation, but as a temporary fix to get a dog over a hump, right on the money. We do it all the time with dogs here that have separation anxiety, or just create antics, or are just keen on barking, whining, digging on the crate, biting on the crate, whatever. E-collar stays on, we hear the monkey business, correct for it, right? You can also use a camera, drop cam, you can order, I think, off of, off of Amazon. They're a great way, hook, hook up to your Wi-Fi and you can watch all the action, and you can see exactly what they're doing, and you can be laying in bed and correct like that. Now. If you don't want to have to deal with the remote and you don't want to have to be on guard and, and like handle it and you don't want a camera or any of that stuff and you want to just like clock out, then just get a bark collar. I recommend Sport Dog. Bark collars are like hard to find a really, 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 really amazing one. Um, I know eCollar Tech is trying to create a really great one. So as soon as I find out who's got the best, um, Moving forward, I'll let you know. Currently, I think the sport dog is the best no bark collar. So those are your two choices. Either you take care of it with the remote. I like remotes because I can correct for anything. A lot of bark collars won't pick up like mm, 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 or scratching at the crate or anything like that or biting at the crate or banging in the crate. Won't pick up that. They only pick up, pick up barks. So the remote, if you can hear or if you've got a camera, you can pick up everything and, and correct everything. So it's really up to you however you want to address it. You can go remote or you can go bar collar, totally up to you. But it's an easy, easy fix. I was gonna close this out by saying that you're, you're, you're um, at the end of your question, you say that as soon as we take the e-collar off and put him in his crate, then we get different behavior. And it's what I've always talked about with why do we drive differently with a cop behind us and why do we drive differently as soon as the cop pulls off the freeway every single person that drives a car knows that feeling if you it, you're lying if you say otherwise you know that feeling of having a cop behind you turn down the radio drive really like safe two hand right what is it uh i don't know like 10 and 2 or something like that on the steering wheel you're like don't pull me over and then the cop like turns off the freeway and you're like I guess I'm playing like Rick James and you just blast on down the road so why because the authority figure who can share consequences for crappy choices and behavior left the scene just like your e-collar did I hope that makes sense so simple fix Put an e-collar on your dog or put a bark dog, bark dog, put a bark collar on your dog and you should be able to sort it out like that. Okay guys, question numero four zero. Oh. Uh, this is from Jackie and um, Jackie, uh, her question was on the Sean O'Shea page rather than the Good Dog page and I'm not gonna go fish so I'm just going to give you my best kind of representation of it which is basically, if I'm not mistaken, excuse me, Jackie's Amstaff, I think, is currently breaking out of the crate. And Jackie wants to know, how do I deal with that? How do I fix it? How do I solve it? How do I resolve it? What the hell do I do to make this stop happening? 
So she mentioned that she was getting a um, more secure crate. Good choice. Um, now it depends. Now if you get like a major crazy heavy duty crate, you don't have to worry about much. If you get one of the impact crates like we use for our crate breakers, you put a carabiner through the little like latch with the, the double hole and like good luck getting out. Like a gorilla couldn't get out of there unless he was really, really determined. There were like bananas right on the other side. But he'd have to be a really determined gorilla. Um, I don't I don't think he would get out. Even the gorilla I don't think would get out. So if you're going to go for like bad jokes aplenty. Sorry guys. Um, it's the pressure of being like this is all me. It's all me. So bear with me. Um, anyways, so if you want to use the impact crate or something like that, then that kind of takes you off the hook in a lot of ways as far as like what you have to do with the regular crate. If you're just getting a little bit of a stronger gauge crate, then you've probably heard my my suggestions my advice in the past but if if you've got like a really cheap crate and they're so easy to break out of like they're literally like any dog with any like in any size or any de any determination can easily break out if you get a nicer crate with a thicker gauge to where they can't break the wires or things like that then you can zip tie all around the crate all around its weak spots which I always recommend for anybody with a dog that's questionable um, once again if you're using like a high-end crate you don't have to do the zip ties but anybody watching this because it's for everybody anybody watching this who has a dog who breaks out of its crate zip tie it you can just buy them at the hardware store buy 50 of them and go around your crate and any of the spots where the crate is vulnerable where it can collapse where the wire crate can, can collapse um, zip tie it zip tie it nice and snug now along with that if you have a regular crate or a high-end heavy gauge crate but still wire crate then go to the hardware store while you're there picking up your your zip ties and get a bunch of leash clips and leash clips are just that. They're what is at the end of a leash. You know, you press the button down and it, it's got that kind of like, I'm gonna do the really bad like, it's got this, you press the button down, it goes like that, right? So we have oodles and oodles of those. You can buy handfuls of them at the hardware store. And what we use those for is for the door, the, the, the door that the dog actually goes out of. If the crate has got like, extra doors like a middle door and a top door those all get zip tied up boom no 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 we don't need multiple access zip tie the hell out of those babies we don't want those are weak spots in the crate but the the door the dog's got to come out of so the zip ties work really really good the zip ties the uh the leash clips work really really good for that because they're very easy to to put on and take off right and typically for Dogs that are pretty intense, what we'll do is we'll usually put like one, two at the top, one, two at the side, and one, two at the bottom for serious guys, right? And that makes that pretty much virtually indestructible, unless you've got a dog that's gonna destroy the, the pan at the bottom or something like that, and those are like one percenter dogs. So that's what I would do if you've got, if Jackie, talking to you, Jackie, if you're just, if you've just got a wire crate that's like kind of a heavier gauge on your hands, zip ties, leash clips. If you've gone out and you've splurged and got yourself a serious crate, you don't need to worry about the leash clips or the, uh, or the zip ties. You've got great stuff. Now, your, the rest of your question was, how do I address this silliness? How do I address him breaking out? Because it's, it's obviously a crappy choice that you want to get rid of. So for any of our crate breakers, which we get all the time, uh, we get separation anxiety dogs all the time, and I catch shit for this all the time, is they go in there, just how I said, crate completely like reinforced, or it's our serious Alcatraz crate like that, and then e-collar's on, and then there's either a camera or we're listening and watching, like secretly, and if we see the dog trying to bite the crate, or scratch at the crate or anything like that? Correct, immediately. Yep, correct immediately with the e-collar. What does that do? It tells your dog straight away, that behavior, unwanted. I don't like that. That's called correction, punishment, however you wanna word it. 
and what it will do is cause that behavior to diminish, 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 diminish. Don't be nervous. Don't be like working at like teeny little levels and be like, I hope I don't create a negative association with the crate. Guys, if your dog's trying to break out of the crate, I've said this a million times, the negative association is already there. You're not going to create a negative association <laughs> right with a dog that already is like let me the hell out of here right he's already got a negative association so let's inhibit that and let's give him an opportunity to have a different feeling about the crate by creating that inhibition right so if the dog's like i'm getting out of here i don't want to be in your ah, and you correct and he's like whoa okay and they sit and they hang out they start to re-examine the crate world. This isn't so bad. Okay, I can handle this. And then you've created the gateway, the doorway, the opening for a dog to create what I call natural counter conditioning. The dog is, is able to create a natural new association with the crate because you block the emotional escalation, because you block the negative feelings right? This is a hard one for so many people. You block the negative feelings with a correction because the negative feelings were correction. Boom. What do I think about this? You can't, you can't create a positive feeling about a crate with a dog who's like, let me the hell out of here. You can't create a positive feeling with that. Can you create a positive feeling with a dog that's like not allowed to misbehave and, and is forced to relax? and then has the opportunity to develop a new sense about the crate? Absolutely, we do it all the time. Do people say, oh, that's the wrong way to go about it and you have to leave them in for five seconds and then take them out and then 10 seconds and take them out in 20 seconds. Sure, people do it all the time and they, they absolutely subscribe to that concept. I don't see it working. I don't see it working at all. Um, along with that, this is not to be missed. This is a really important point. And this point is that if you've got a dog who's giving you trouble in the crate and you're spoiling, allowing, being permissive, or not holding them accountable in tiny contexts, tiny moments, you're allowing a, a bunch of like crappy little choices to go down and you might even think they're benign and like not so crappy, you, you gotta look. You gotta look really closely that will cause your dog to be like, what do you mean me in the crate? King doesn't go in the crate. King's out here wandering around. Versus you do this, you do this, you do this. Place, come to me now, lay down, walk like this. Don't move through that threshold until I tell you. Don't move off that place command until I tell you. When I tell you to get over here, get your rear over here, stat. Now that's a dog who's like, whoa, hopping too. When you put them in the crate, how do you think their attitude is? The thing nobody knows about or nobody talks about in dog training, the attitude. It's like everything. It's the whole enchilada that everybody's missing. It's crazy. But that's for another story for another day. So if you're trying to just in one context Get your dog to not be a crate breaker and you're going to use a better crate and better tools and correct and all that but you're going to continuously and i'm not saying you are but i'm just putting this out there for you and for everybody else if you're going to allow more shenanigans more looseness more freedom more kind of monkey business in the house then you have to expect more monkey business in the crate because they're all super interconnected we've got a separation anxiety guy here right now and I'm telling you, his separation anxiety is not separation anxiety. Everybody's like, oh, he's got confinement anxiety or he's got, you know, whatever. No, he's got a bad attitude, a bad freaking attitude wrapped up in a cute, cute package. He, he feels completely, He feels completely 100% that it's unacceptable that he's in a crate. Does that make sense? Because he's treated 
with so much entitlement, so much freedom, so much empowerment, so much affection, so much love, so much like you're the king, like should be fanning him, that when you put him in a crate, he's like, are you kidding me? Me? No. So that's why attitude is so important and that's why overall lifestyle is so important if you're dealing with these other things. Too many people compartmentalize and they miss the big picture. That's why we do so well with things here. And I'm not tooting, tooting our own horn. I'm just saying that because we work on kind of the macro attitude, personality, all this stuff, dogs go in crates after having kind of like firm conversations about how life is going to be. And they're like, this makes sense. I'll just hang. I'm good. I'll just be in, I'll just be in the crate versus dogs that are allowed to be otherwise. I hope that makes sense. Boy, was that a long answer to what could have been a very short question. Okay, so we're at like number five already. The show has flown by. Well, not really. I've answered some really, really Philodon, long in the tooth questions. Guys, and by the way, I know that long in the tooth doesn't mean lengthy. It means a we just say it just to frustrate and annoy her. So anybody who's like, you know, long in the tooth doesn't mean that. It means old. Like, we know. Anyways, okay. So let's get on to Paul here. So Paul's got a really long post. I'll see if I can like blaze through this. I'm a UK-based dog owner working towards a being becoming a dog trainer. The information from open and honest trainers like yourself, Jeff G. Huh. Jeff G and Laura helped me work out a plan and method for my personal dog, adopted now coming up to four years. I had a similar history as a lot of adoptees with rescue dogs with troubles, being guided to trainers that only believed in certain methods that were politically cor politically correct and looked great on paper and in, and in a controlled environment, but when in the real world just didn't work for us. Um, I currently am practicing on tuning my skills um, on my personal dog and volunteer as a dog uh, fosterer. Your foundation training and great advice has helped change the way I handled and viewed my own dog and how he handled and viewed the world and we are really progressing well. Sorry, my eyes are giving me a hard time. He has changed from a bratty boy that I was embarrassed to take out to one I take out every day to the coffee shop, nice, next to the park and get regular heartwarming comments on his good behavior. That is awesome. Um, that's so awesome. Uh, though both he and I still are on a journey of improvement. Of course you are, Paul, but like really nice work, buddy. Um, I'm planning, I'm planning long term to become a dog trainer, but to get the experience plan to take dog, uh, but, it, but to get the experience plan to take dog walking, um, dog sitting, then dog, then the dog training route as my skills develop and opportunities arise. Basically he's going to start, um, as a, um, uh, bah, 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 as a dog walker and a dog sitter to gain better skills to be a dog trainer, which is smart. Uh, my question, in the area of dog walking and sitting, I plan to vet clients and take ones I can handle, but ideally would prefer to educate my charges, look at you, fancy, lang fancy language, educate my charges with tools that make the walks and sitting times uh, more controlled for me. Uh, and hopefully educational for the pooches in the long run. I also have a niggling shoulder injury which cannot take mad polars. In your experience of working your way up through this area, how do you recommend handling, uh, what tools to use, and the communication of that to the owners? Uh, P.S. I will be attending the Eastbourne training seminar with my dog. We are both looking forward to it. Thanks for all your help and advice. Well, Paul, we won't be right in Eastbourne because it's been a lot of chaos. But we will see you nonetheless at the undisclosed location. Excellent. I can't, can't wait to meet you. So really, really nice stuff from Paul. Paul's obviously heavily committed. He's done a lot of research, done a lot of work, um, worked hard with his dog and it sounds like foster dogs as well, worked through our foundation program and, and has found a lot of answers, a lot of help. So um, bully for you in, in your uh, native tongue. Um, so, Let's jump into this because Paul, I think Paul knows that I started out as a dog walker. So let me see if I can kind of like unravel this and, and, and kind of wrap up this, uh, this show with, with, uh, with this one. So 
uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. How, basically the overview is how to get walking clients on board with tools and sitting clients as well. So first, back in the day, I would only take clients who were reasonable, right? If they had really bad dogs that were maniacs um, and they wouldn't use any tools that would help me have a decent walk with them, uh, I'm trying to remember if I would even take them. Um, the thing was, and, and, and here, here's a really kind of like honest um, like piece of this. So the limitation of tools, the less you have, the more creative you'll get. The more you'll find ways to be able to create what you want, create safety, create you know a nice bounce pack, things like that. So there were dogs early on that um, I could only use a martingale on. Luckily, they weren't maniacs or anything like that. Um, but walking big packs of dogs to two, um, two would, wouldn't even be my guys. Um, like six, eight, twelve, fourteen, something like that packs of dogs, you've got to make sure you've got them in a good space so you can find yourself in trouble really, really quick. So um, the only dogs that were not allowed to walk on prong with me were dogs that were kind of like cupcake dogs. Um, there were a couple Goldens and they were from my very, very first, if you read my book, you'll, you'll know I'm talking, I've talked about an older woman and uh, her name was Carolyn Bender. She just passed away. My heart goes out. Um, Carolyn Bender had Goldens and uh, she was all about Martingale and um, her dogs didn't really need much more than that. So my point is though, if you can't use these tools, you got to find some way to be able to uh, influence these dogs or you choose simply, like you said, to vet the clients more carefully and say, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a dog that was a complete maniac, that was a, a risk to the rest of the pack that could create major reactivity or a pack uh, attack or go after prey or anything like that if I wasn't able to use the right tools. I just wouldn't do it. It would be unsafe for me and unsafe for the rest of the dogs. And I, I think it's a, bad, it's a bad call and I think it's a disempowered call. So I wouldn't go that direction. Um, so if they've got like, cupcakes you can get away with like different tools right if they got serious dogs time for a serious conversation and if they're not ready for it if they're not able to hear it if they're not willing to adjust it's probably best if you let them go so um one of the things i, I have a bunch of notes for you um if you can kind of explain to them now the uk is so different the uk is like it's fevered pitch over there but if you can get to explain to these people if they're open-minded enough that you know I'm gonna use a prong collar on your dog and maybe you can even demo it so they know what you're dealing what they're dealing with because they've been told prong collars are torture devices so if you can actually like demo doing the work you can you can probably convince them to be like whoa that's very different than what I thought you know what I was gonna say is that you can say, yeah, I'm going to walk your dog on these tools, but I'm also going to give you complimentary training. I'm going to teach your dog how to walk really, really nice. I'm going to teach him how to sit at corners, right? I'm going to teach him how to be polite. I'm going to teach him how to be more uh, rich with impulse control. I'm going to teach him how to be more deferential to the handler, more respectful, all sorts of good behavior. So, and if the client says they don't want that, get rid of them. Anyways, so that's one way you could look at it, right? If you've got an open-minded person, you'd be like, hey, I'm gonna, this is going to be free training for you, you know? But if they're like hysterical, like a prong collar, you're going to kill my dog? Like, it's not a good fit. Um, let's see. Uh, the other thing I said is, um, or I said, but I wrote, is that um, the more you build your reputation, the more you'll find that people will be open-minded to hearing suggestions about tools and approaches and methodology and things like that. The more you're a newbie, the more you're kind of coming out of the woodwork and being like, hey, I want to walk your dogs or hey, I'm available and these are the tools I want to use. And they're like, yeah, and who are you? That's a harder sell. 
when you've got more traction, more momentum, and they know who you are, and they know that you do good work, and they know that you're safe, and they know that you're responsible, and they know that you're caring, they'll feel very different about it. So getting that leverage of trust is a huge component to being able to say, let's try this, right? If they like you and trust you and feel safe, getting them to try another tool isn't that big of a stretch. If you don't have that, it's a huge stretch. So that's something that takes time to build. I hope that makes sense. I mean, I know this sounds like, I just, I, I want you to get that getting from point A of like trying to build something and having people, having people be okay with your tools and your approach and methodology, there's an art to that. It's gonna take time. It's gonna take time for you to get there. Initially, like I songed and danced a lot of people, like, okay, you don't wanna use that? We'll try this, we'll try that, you know? When you're disempowered, when you don't have the leverage, when you don't have the notoriety, when you don't have the brand recognition, when you don't have the name recognition, you kinda of have to do what you kinda of have to do. And that's like, you have to dance a little bit. And it's uncomfortable and it stinks, but it's the reality. The reality is like, if you need to make the bucks, if you need to make sure you got business coming in, then compromises are probably involved in that. But just like I was saying with the people that were talking about building businesses, you should have a North Star that you're shooting for, which is like, here's where I'm starting, I'll take everybody, I'll do my best, and then I'll be moving towards only, only dogs that will walk on these tools um, because this is a necessity for me to have a healthy situation, a comfortable walk, a safe walk, no pack attacks, and if prey goes by, we're all cool and all that good stuff. So, um, I think that's about it for you, Paul. Um, I wish I had like some magic potion or some magic response, but the magic response is really like always the same response. And that's be incredibly driven, be incredibly determined, know what you want, know that you want to become a dog trainer and know that you want to become a dog trainer of, of some high level of respect and, and consideration and reputation. And that to get there, you're gonna have to eat a lot of crap. You're gonna to have to start at the bottom. You're gonna to have to deal with clients that are like, you do it this way. And unless you don't need the money, unless you're independently wealthy, you don't really have a choice. So I didn't have a choice. I took what I could and I rolled with it knowing that I would keep building towards um, a more empowered, uh, a more healthy, um, uh, a better approach of working with the clients and working with the dogs. And I knew initially like I wasn't going to be in that space. And I think that's the same thing for you. So anyways, I've gotten a little far afield with that, but I hope that helps. I hope it makes sense. Um, start where you're at, be flexible, be nice. You can't be too demanding. You can't be too like, Hey, it's gotta be this way. It's my way or the highway, which I'm not saying is your style, but I'm just saying you kind of have to like, be flexible until you have a little more leverage. And then you can say, these are the tools I use. And if your clients want you and you do kick-ass work, they'll be like, that's cool. I'm okay with that because Paul's a badass. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, you, gotta, you gotta be in the trenches. You gotta dig through the dirt until you can get to a spot where you don't have to anymore. And that's just the realities of life. So anyways, guys, I hope this uh, Q&A has been helpful. I know it's just me, so you don't get any change. It's just, it's just, it's just this. But um, hopefully it's been fun. Hopefully it's been entertaining. Hopefully it's been educational more than anything. And of course, as always, any questions about this, hit me up in the comments and, um, and we'll try and tackle it and try and help you out with it. So thanks for watching. You guys have been here a long time. We're, we're uh, what is this, episode 139. So we're cruising up on 200. So we've been here a while. So thanks so much. Um, always, appreciate you guys, always appreciate you guys a ton. And um, I'm gonna go grab some dinner and go relax. And um, I'll see you guys down the road, all right? See ya.